Hello everyone. And uh, everyone is welcome to this, to this uh, webinar. We're quite excited to have you. Um, we have a few technical yeah, issues in, internally, trying to sort out uh, hosting and co-hosting so that you don't keep seeing uh, everyone who's in the waiting room and I don't have to take all that responsibility. But in the meantime, uh, you are welcome to the TechBiz Transformation Series. The whole idea is to help build, adapt, and thrive. So build your business, adapt to the changes of what today brings, and then thrive, of course, in, in, in success. The focus really is to consistently deliver to you uh, meaningful, highly qualitative content that enables you and your business to thrive. This is the fourth of um, such series that we're running. And we've been running uh, in, on different topics that indeed are meant to enhance your business. So in the beginning, we started with pitching for businesses who have to pitch their business either to investors or to um, any kind of uh, support groups. We also had a conversation on commercializing your apps because we know that we are dealing with, with techies. And then we also had uh, something to talk about finance, with knowing how important that is. Today, we will be talking about intellectual property and uh, it's going to be really an exciting journey. So hashtag uh, eco innovation, hashtag tech biz series. Uh, if and when you hear any of those nuggets, feel free to post. A quick housekeeping, we will have uh, the first part will be a discussion. And that discussion will be uh, our host our, or our guest will be discussing on IP. And then you can feel free at any point to type in your questions into the, into the chat box. You don't need to wait until the end. Once your questions are in, we will take it as we, as we go along. Uh, but then again, the last 30 minutes of the discussion is going to be fully Q&A. So the Q&A will take two, two um, ways that you can post your question. You can either put it in the chat room or we can unmute you and then you can ask your question uh, verbally. Now, a lot of people ask the question, before we quickly go into the topic of today, what really does eco-innovation, uh, what does it do? And you see it very clearly on the, on the screen. The purpose of eco-innovation is to leverage two critical enablers, that's innovation and technology, to solve poverty and its symptoms in, within the entire continent, so within the whole of Africa. Now, two key words you need to remember is innovation and technology. So in the event that whether your business, whether your value proposition is within the scope, we are definitely here to, to help. So we offer learning, and this is one of such learning. We teach soft skills, we teach hard skills uh, that help businesses and help entrepreneurs or techpreneurs as well. Uh, acceleration is an area where we're very, very passionate about. If you have an MVP, minimum valuable product, you have already a small business that you want to accelerate, here we are. Uh, to provide that level of, of support. So we're going to go ever so quickly into the topic of today. We're going to talk about intellectual property. And we've had many questions already that have been posted. Remember when you were registering, you were asked what were your expectations? And we see that the expectations really is how do I protect my business? How do I protect my ideas? How do I protect my data? Particularly within the context of our country, yes. On the other side is when you go outside of the country, uh, sometimes that could be a challenge. And today we have a real, real expert here to take us through what uh, IP is about. And she is the head of intellectual property. I think that's, that must be an error. She's a senior partner uh, covering intellectual property, technology, entertainment, and media in Bangu and, and uh, Igodali. I think the best thing will be for Chinaza herself to introduce herself uh, in the right way. Chinaza, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm excited about today, and I'll be sharing a number of things with you that things I do every day. Um, it's, it's what I do every day. Um, I'll start by saying that, no, I'm not a senior partner in Bawa Nigodalo. I'm a senior associate in Bawa Nigodalo. Um, I'm the team leader in the intellectual property and technology media entertainment um, practice group. 
And um, I've ha I have over a decade um, experience in intellectual property. I've advised a lot of clients, both from startups to well-established companies on their intellectual property rights. And I'll be excited to answer all the questions that you may have today. I've seen a number of them already, and I'm happy that those questions are popping out. A couple of years back, we didn't have all these questions. People just went about their business without thinking about intellectual property. So it's, these are exciting times, and I look forward to sharing the time with you. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Awesome. Thanks for correcting, correcting that. And uh, we want to get right into it, protecting your business ideas, your information, your data, what to do when IP rights are infringed, because that obviously is one of the key concerns that you have and we will be tackling uh, today. The last one about protecting your stake in partnership and even sometimes when you have conversations with investors or third party outside of the country, how do you still make sure that what belongs to you, you are able to retain, retain that? Um, Chinasa, we will go through your presentation uh, at, right, right away but I have one question for you. At the end of this webinar, what would you like our participants to take home? I'd like the participants to have an idea, a better idea of what intellectual property is and how to protect it for their business, how important it is for their business, how to protect their rights, how to do the right things, and also commercialize the rights to be able to gain profit from their IP rights. So if I'm able to succeed in making you at least know the basics of intellectual property, I don't expect you to become experts after this session, but you should be able to know the basics, you should be able to know who to go to for help, and you're able to take the necessary steps to protect your IP rights. Excellent. You mentioned something to me earlier about uh, something you would like to do to support uh, our audience. You want to say it now? <laughs> okay, um, so as just to show um, my support to what um, Meco Innovation Center is doing, I would like to take um, maybe five individuals or five businesses for a one hour, you know, sort of coaching or discussion that is directly, directly, you know, directed at their business, individual coaching for just one hour in the coming week. So Monday, 1%, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just for one hour, go through your business, discuss your intellectual property issues and all that. And this would all be pro bono or free. Thank you, Gina. So, so that's five people will receive um, IP coaching, right? Coaching specific- Specific to their business. To, to their business, exactly and it's within the context of intellectual uh, property right yes not every legal <laughs> not every legal issue that you have but just um ip specific queries questions if you want to just have like something that is tailored more to what you need we can have that conversation for about an hour so in the coming week monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday i'll take one person or one business um this. that's amazing so you're going to tell we us have, the criteria. We have a way like to, um, maybe the first, I mean, I can't even say first people to ask questions because um, some questions have already been submitted, right? Um, I guess it would be random. <laughs> well, maybe the first people to indicate their interest, the first five people to indicate their interest. I think what would be very nice, right, is um, if indeed, like you say, people who indicate their interest but in the event that they can give a little bit of an inkling into what their scope is, so that then, uh, well, this is, there's some form of criteria to make the selection of the five people, okay? All right, so we're gonna go straight into it. And uh, Chinna said the floor is yours. If you want me to move, because the control is on my side. If you want me to move, you can. Okay. okay, so, um, thank you very much, um, Lydia. And um, I don't intend to do a lot of talking over, uh, about my slides. I will just run through the slides and then, because I want to give more time to questions and to have um, a more interactive session. So I'll be talking on remodeling your business, but just intellectual property 101 for your business. That's what I call it, intellectual property 101. It's just the basics of IP for your business. And we're going to run through quickly what is intellectual property, the types of intellectual property rights, 
regulation of IP rights in Nigeria, we'll have a little um, recap, and then we'll look at summary of what IP lawyers do, so that if you need to get in touch with an IP lawyer, you know exactly what, how they can help you. And then we'll take some questions, of course, and comments. Yes. So what is intellectual property? You know, um, I like to say that intellectual property is all around us, you know, from the bed that we sleep on, to the toothpaste we use to brush our teeth, to the clothes we put on, everything around us, the air conditioner in our, in our rooms, the cars that we drive in, paintings on the wall, pictures, name it, whatever it is, the glasses you're wearing, your handbag, your clothes, you know, IP is all around us. And it's just basically legal rights that result from intellectual activity, you know, in the scientific, industrial, literary, artistic field. Um, intangible creations. And the easiest way for me to explain this, and I usually tell my colleagues at work is, if you say Mr. A married Miss B, they bought a property located in um, Sango Tedo, they built a house, the, uh, Mr. B died, but before he died, he willed all his property to Miss B, including all his shares and things like that. People generally are able to identify with that because they know, okay, Mr. B, oh, that man that lives down the street, you know, Miss B, you know the property, where it's located, you know, okay, shares, you know that you can go to so-and-so company and get the shares to, um, that he owns and things like that. You talk about wills and inheritance. All of those things are pretty clear and most people easily just get it. But when you talk about intellectual property, everyone is like, okay, what, is it, what kind of property is intellectual? Intellectual property really is just those properties that you can't really touch them. You know, somebody sang a song, what's in the song? Why, why should that be protected? Or someone wrote a book, what's the special right in the book that should be protected? I made, I invented something that can help you read your messages in two seconds. What's the, protect, what's the protection there? They are intangible. They're not things you can hold on to, but they're things that come from creativity, you know, from the human mind or from the human intellect. Um, and these assets could be so many, like I said, IP is all around us and IP law actually aims at safeguarding creators and their producers by giving them time limited rights to control the use of those, um, of those things. And this definition is very important because a lot of people just feel that, oh, once I've got an IP right, generally, oh, it's forever and ever and ever. Some of those rights are time limited, they're not forever. And even those rights that can continue forever have you know, certain conditions, like you have to renew them, you have to pay certain fees and, and things like that. But then it grants you the right to control the use of those things that you have made. So IP rights protect creators, what they have created for time limited periods and they control the use of it. And, uh, um, this screen just shows a number of, um, well, types of IP rights. We have trademarks, patents, design, copyright, trade secrets. There are so many more. There's artificial intelligence, um, industrial circuits, um, domain names, and so on and so forth. But I've just chosen to speak um, about these five rights because um, they are, well, I would say they are more common gener I mean, generally in Nigeria. These are the kind of rights to see popping up a lot of times that people are willing and you know really know about and are able to protect and then again based on the development of our law as well trademark protects the name logo slogan so if you have a product or a company your name the slogan you use for it the slogan um patents protects the invention or the processes you know if you have an invention or a process something you have created um it could be in the field of technology biotechnology it could be in the mechanical field whatever it is if you have an invention you can protect it even pharmaceutical by like patents Design protects the shapes and models of products. Um, copyright protects the artistic, literary, you know, um, cinematographic works that you create. Then trade secrets actually protect sensitive information that give a business a competitive edge in the market. Um, and then these are just examples of some trademark. Like I said, it could be a word, logo, design, and so on. Um, there's Yahoo, Adidas, BBC. It could be a logo. It could be a word. It could be a combination of it. It could be a slogan. If you, if you see, for instance, everywhere you go, you don't need anybody to tell you that that's an NTN. But the most important thing to know about the trademark is whatever form it may take, a trademark basically just distinguishes the source of a product or a service from that of another. 
So whether it's a logo, a word, a jingle, it could even be a sound. So um, I say tell people when you hear, -na 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 -na, you, you already know that that's Nokia because you're able to identify that sound as a Nokia phone or even there are certain um, sounds that are specific to certain phones or certain things or um, it could even be a scent. You know, um, if you have an Yves Saint Laurent, um, someone spray an Yves Saint Laurent perfume and pass you, you would know that, oh, that's this kind of um, perfume. It just identifies where a product or a service comes from. Um, let's go ahead. I think this is where we will eventually have to talk about counterfeiting, which is a major problem on this part of the world. Um, well, for counterfeiting, um, in my, well, I was going to get to that subsequently, but I can just quickly talk about that since you mentioned it now. You're entitled, a trademark that is registered or that has been used for a, a period is entitled to protection, right? And what that simply means is that you have exclusive rights to use that trademark. And anybody who makes unauthorized use of that trademark, unauthorized simply means you didn't let the person use it. You didn't say, oh, you can use it either by way of license or permitted use or whatever, right? That person will be said to be infringing on your rights. Now, when you come to counterfeiting, right? Um, people have a lot of misconceptions about counterfeiting. They feel that, oh, once something is fake, it's a counterfeit and then it's wrong. A counterfeit may not necessarily be a fake product, right? It could just be a, it is just a product that did not come from the source that you said it came from, okay? So if, for instance, I produce um, telephones and my manufacturing plant is in China and I import those, I bring in those telephones and I sell them in Nigeria and someone else goes to the manufacturing plant and give them exactly the same specification, they give them exactly the same phones and all that, and they bring it into the country. That product is a counterfeit. It's even though it does exactly the same thing my own does and all that. Why? Because it did not come from me. Like we said, a, count, a, tra a trademark is what identifies the source of a product, right? It may be fake, it may not be fake, but the point is that if someone is producing something and using your trademark, when the person is not you, then the person is counterfeiting your product. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Then the next one I'll just quickly talk on because I want to um, quickly rush down is um, a patent. A patent is a right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling any invention. It's a grant by the government for an invention. So if you if you if you invent something that is new, results from inventive activity, and is capable of industrial application, the, you apply to the government and you can be given a grant for that patent. New means that it's never been it has never existed before nobody has done it before in that particular field of art or whatever there's nothing like that it results from inventive activity so you didn't just discover something or you're not just walking and something fell on your laps or whatever there's some level of creativity that has gone into create into getting that product and then capable of industrial application so you come up with something and that's it Nobody else can use it. Nobody else can make it. There's nowhere else you can send it to or sell it. Then you, can't, you, can't, you cannot get a patent for it because it cannot be used industrially. Okay? Let's move on. And I think the last thing I'll talk about here is copyright. And copyright protects original works of authorship. So in the literary, dramatic, musical, artistic field, and all that copyright protects protects you and if there's some um if there's some um, poetry song even computer software, because under a law the definition of um you get protection under copyright the good thing about copyright is that copyright is automatic right it's not something that you have to necessarily go and register anywhere as far as you've come up with something that is new and it has been fixed in a particular medium. It's original, right? You, you're entitled to copyright um, protection. It's automatic, whether or not you've gone to do any registration. Is that smaller? Okay, and I think the, um, this is about trade secret. Now, the World Intellectual Property Organization um, talks about, well, define a trade secret and says it's valuable information. Um, it's commercial, commercially valuable. It's known to just a few people. 
and the subject reasonable steps to protect it. The owner has taken reasonable steps to protect it. If you have some information, some people call it know-how, some information for your business that nobody else knows, that thing that sets you apart from every other person, that's your trade secret. Whatever you use in your business that makes the difference, the, the easiest example would be the Coca-Cola, the formula for Coca-Cola. Everybody knows about Coca-Cola and how for years and years, nobody has been able to crack it to know what the actual ingredients or the active ingredients in the drink is. It's protected by trade secret. So it is not registered as a patent, it's not registered anywhere, but it's protected as trade secret. And just as the definition I mentioned above said, it's commercially valuable because it's secret. It's secret, nobody knows about it. Only a few people know about it. The, the story is that for Coca-Cola, only two people at every point in time in life ever know the, the formula, don't know how true that is. And those people never meet and so on. There are all sorts of stories behind the Coca-Cola formula. And then you've taken reasonable steps to make it confidential. So if, for instance, you've gone out of your way to do what, I mean, over and above what is required to protect your IP, you store it in a, in a safe, you lock it up, it's, it's encrypted, not everybody can touch it, things like that. That's your trade secret. But basically your trade secret is what sets you apart from others. That little know-how, that information, confidential information that nobody else knows about, that's perceived. Within the context of tech, let me ask you, since you're also a, you know, a tech expert, within that context, what will fall under trade secrets? It's a, within the context of technology, that's already right. your question. Yes, within the context of technology, what will fall under trade secrets? So whether, will it be my software or maybe- oh, things like your my... source code. Things like your source code you know, some very sensitive information on how your stuff works. Anything that, I mean, it's just the icing, the, the main thing, it's just like when you have a recipe, you know, and you've made a bit of cake and everybody's like, okay, I know there's milk, there's this, there's that, but there's something you can't quite touch, you know, which gives it the final flair. That's what your trade secret is. So like I said, um, in for, for, the, for the technological field, it will be things like their software and any other sensitive information that is not disclosed to anybody. Sorry. Right? In Nigeria, we have so many laws that regulate IP, um, Trademarks Act, the Paris Convention, which is a convention. Okay, so let me just explain that quickly. So there are legislations which are like laws, you know, enacted by the, by the National Assembly and all that for the, for the, for the um, country on different topics. And then there are conventions, which are like um, treaties that are entered into between countries or nations over certain topic. In this case, in Nigeria, we have legislation as an act of parliament and all of that. And then we also have international conventions that Nigeria is signatory to. So under trademarks, we have the Trademarks Act, Cap T13. We have the Paris Convention. We have um, under patent and industrial design, we have the patent and design act, which covers the two subjects, the patent corporation treaty. There are so many other treaties, actually. The copyright, we have the copyright act and the international agreement on copyright, like the Brent Convention, Rome Convention, and so on. For designs, we also have the, um, the Hague Convention as well. So one of the things, that, let me just uh, come in here. One of the things, remember uh, the, the questions that the teams had been asking right from the beginning was the how, right? Within our local context. So the, what are the laws and how can I activate, how can I activate the laws? So, I mean, I know you're going to cover that, but it will be interesting to already know what are the key points in, in those laws that protect us or protect our data, protect our trade secrets and what, what do we need to do to be able to activate those laws in the event that there's a contravention? Okay, so, um, okay, so maybe I would use this picture since it's already up <laughs> to explain um, what, okay. to answer your question. Okay, so trademark, like I said, would cover things like the logo, the name, and all of that. It is an Apple um, phone, an iPhone, and we can see the Apple logo. You know, so even if you walk into a store, wherever it is from afar, you don't see Apple anywhere, you don't see iPhone region anywhere. Once you see that logo, it would let you know that that phone is an Apple phone, that it's Apple that manufactured it. Now in Nigeria, 
under the Trademarks Act, you can protect your name, your logo, your slogan, your trademarks at the Trademarks Registry, right? The Act says that anybody who uses or um, intends to use a trademark can go to the um, Trademark Registry and apply for the registration of the trademark. To apply for this, all you need to do is to pay the requisite fees, the application fee, Submit, if you are using a third party, let's say a lawyer or somebody, an agent, submit a power of attorney, you know, attach that power of attorney to your application. Um, list, indicate the name of the trademark or the logo or whatever it is. Indicate the trademark anyway. Um, the classes of interest. Now, let me explain that. Every product or everything on earth is, is categorized into certain classes for the purposes of registration as a trademark. So class one would cover things like chemicals used in industry and all of that. Class two will cover paints, vanishes, and so on. Class three, cosmetics. Class four, oil and twin. Class five, pharmaceuticals. And it goes on and on and on. Nigeria uses, there are various classifications of goods and services, but Nigeria uses the NIST classification of goods and services, which divides all, everything on earth into 45 classes. So in submitting your trademark application, you need to indicate the class of interest. And that class of interest has to be the class in which you use the trademark. So if you're a technological company, for instance, you may want to register your trademark in class 42. It covers technological um, services, for instance. If you're a bank, you know, class 36 covers financial matters, real estate, and things like that. So that's the class that you indicate. If you register your trademark, or if you apply to register your trademark in a class for which you do not use it, you may subsequently lose your rights to that trademark for non-use. Um, there's something in law I'm just trying to not be too technical here. Or you may not even get a van class. So in, in filing your application, like I said, you submit the name of the trademark or the logo or whatever the representation of the trademark is. The class of interest, is you pay the requisite fee, um, is there any other thing? And then you need to give details of the applicants. That would be your name, depending on if it's an individual or a company, your name or the name of the company that is the applicant, your status, are you a Nigerian citizen or a company registered in Nigeria, things like that, and you submit your application, right? Upon receipt of that application at the registry, and please, guys, note, I'm just talking about the procedure in Nigeria because the various jurisdictions have various um, procedures. Upon receipt of that application, the registry would conduct an examination. That examine, well, first of all, acknowledge receipt of your application. And that acknowledgement is important because it indicates two things. The number of your application, which would remain the number of that application until, an, until um, a registration certificate is issued. And then the filing date. Now, under our laws, the date you file the application in the event that your application is successful and is granted registration will become the date of registration. So what that means is if I file my application in January 1, 2020, but my certificate doesn't issue till June 11, 2020, but it does issue, maybe it overcomes any objections and all of that, and if I get my certificate, my date of registration will be January 1, the date I filed it. So that's why the acknowledgement is very, very important. The date is acknowledged at the registry. After that, the registry will conduct an examination to just check to see if there's any reason why that mark shouldn't be accepted for registration. For instance, is there already an existing mark on the register or is it disallowed in any way? Is it scandalous? If you want to register a, a trademark for maybe uh, Buhari Must Die, the name of your trademark, for instance, that's scandalous it's against public policy and all of that. The registry will check for all those details and if they feel that it's not, it shouldn't be registered, it will be refused. The registrar will issue an objection. In the event that there's no objection to the registration of your um, application, the mark would produce, um, would pr proceed to um, acceptance stage. After it's accepted, it will be published in the Trademarks Journal. Trademark Journal is just a do public document where all the um, trademarks that have been filed are published for any third party to raise any objection within a two, two month window. If there is no objection that is raised within that period, um, the mark would proceed. You can go and pay your ceiling fees and get your registration certificate, right? That's about trademarks. A trademark in Nigeria is valid for the, in the first instance for seven years, and after that, it's renewable every 14 years. So a trademark is an example of, it, of an IP that you, right, that you can have forever and 
ever, provided you keep renewing it. In Nigeria, if you, I, I mean, I've dealt with Max when I filed in 1950-something, 1960-something, and the client, the, the owners of the Mac have continued to, you know, renew, renew, renew up till the present day, right? The second thing I want to just quickly talk about is patents, right? Patents, call, um, in the example I've given, would protect the working part, it's the invention. So if you have things like autocomplete, autocorrect, and all of that, or the internal workings of the phone, you can't see it. Like I said, these are all intangible rights, but they are there and they're actually um, you know, doing some function. That will be protected by um, copyright, the working parts of the mobile phone. Sorry, by patent, right? And like I said, patent is a grant by the government for an invention that is useful and that um, grant is just for a, a brief period. What does that mean? It's not something that, that um, continues or inures in perpetuity. It is that you have invented something and then in, ex in exchange for disclosing to the government what you have invented, the government grants you exclusive rights to exploit it, to use it, to determine who is authorized or not to use it for that period, for a certain period, after which it goes into the public domain. What I mean by going to the public domain is that it becomes free for all. Anybody can use it, you know, unless there's some improvement to it. And then in the case that you have so um, in the technological field and what is getting patent, they keep doing R&D so that even if this one is entering into the public domain in the next 20 years, you realize that, okay, they already have something, a new, an improvement on it, for which they'll get another patent, and another patent endures for another 20 years, and it keeps going on and on. But the original um, functions or invention would be in the public domain and will be free for all. And that's why, for instance, if you pick up your phone, you realize that a lot of the functions are the same. There may just be slight differences or variations, even though, again, there's the aspect of licensing where um, technological companies license from each other the use of certain software and the use of certain um, patented inventions and all that. In Nigeria, to bring it home, the time limit for um, the patent is 20 years, and this needs to be renewed annually every year by paying what we call the annuity, which is just the patent renewal fees, right? And that's about how much? Um, hmm. The patent renewal fees. The exact amount in terms of um uh a rough, just a rough uh, figure ballpark. Now during excluding just the official fees, excluding any agent fees, <laughs> because I'm I don't want to say I'm conflicted, yeah. So so hold on. If I need to keep a certain amount of money when I'm creating my annual budget. And I need to keep a certain amount of money for everything concerning patents. What would that be? Um, I would say have a minimum of eighty to hundred thousand naira. No, for the annual registration and annual renewals, fifty to eighty thousand naira. But if you are filing your patent for the first time, you should have a minimum of eighty to hundred thousand naira. I see. Okay. okay. That's, that's, that's right. today. One of the things yes. that was asked prior was also how long does it take? So you talked about the steps on, you know, registered trademarks and steps on patents. Yes. And thank you for touching on the cost. How long does the end to end take? Um, it's, it's, we have a very, um, for want of a better word, a very dicey process in Nigeria right um things haven't been as smooth as they should be but there's been over the time we've seen some level of improvement right i would say that currently to for a trademark to be registered you need um about from start to finish at least nine months nine and sometimes it could get into get up to 24 months you know okay. yes depending on several factors like if there's been an objection you're trying to overcome if there's if it was refused if there's been an opposition um if, you, if the files at the registry get missing there are so many it's it's a lot you know there are a lot of challenges but i mean the current administration at the trademarks registry and patent registry have shown some level of you know um goodwill and in, intention to move things forward for patents, are, that's a lot faster. You could get your patent registered within a month or at the most two months 
if you submit all the relevant documents. And I would explain that I was going to get to that. In Nigeria, on the process, in the procedure, under the procedure for um, patent registration, unlike the trademarks where you file, you do an examination and all of that, when you submit the relevant document for your, trade, for your patent application, the um, relevant filing fees application with the details of the patent, you know, um, if you have any claims, a specific thing that you're claiming is the novel idea or the novel invention, you know, that you're um, claiming protection for and all of that, the registry um, does what we call a formal examination. So it's not an examination as to the content of the patent or the patentability of what you have. That's the position in Nigeria under our current law, right? In other jurisdictions, they have patent examiners who are, you know, um, trained in examining patents and so in other regions like America, Europe and the rest of them, you find that if you first of all have a first degree in a relevant field or scientific field. So you have a mechanical engineer that now qualifies as a patent attorney um, subsequently or a technological engineer that qualifies as a patent attorney. So they conduct, you know, they draft patents that have those um, critical um, information required to get your claim sorted. But under our laws, we don't have that, unfortunately. We're working on that, and you know, the government is working on that. But at present, there's no examination as to the content. So what that simply means is that if I want to file a patent, all they just check, you have the, you submitted the paid the fees, check, you submitted the application, check, you have your claims, check, 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 and your patent is granted. But our law now says that the patent is granted at the risk of the patentee. That is at your own risk, meaning that it could be challenged in court. It could be invalidated. You don't know what's going to happen. Unfortunately, there's a death of laws. We don't have so many case law on patent, on patent and patentability in Nigeria. But it would be interesting to know how our courts would um, look at these issues. Right? So if I, if I file for my trademark, patent, copy, any of these, does it yes. have global coverage or it's only local? How far does my coverage go? Um, it depends. And I'll, I'll explain that IP rights are generally territorial. You know, um, that's the starting point. But if you've come, along, um, come across a lot of lawyers, you know that for every general rule, there could be one million exceptions, right? So um, generally, IP rights are territorial. That's the starting point. So it, the fact that I've filed a trademark to register Chinasa in class five in Nigeria doesn't stop anybody from any other person from registering Chinasa in Uganda or somewhere else, you know, and using it. That's the starting point. However, when a trademark or an IP right, well, this is in terms of trademark, for instance, if that trademark becomes so popular or so well known that everywhere you go, you know, people already know it and associate it with a particular company, right? That could you know, stand as a bar to your registration, or even if you register, they could successfully challenge your registration. Under our law, I talked about the opposition um, period, for instance, under trademark, you could file a trademark, and within that window, someone that has an interest, sees it advertised in the journal, can actually oppose the registration and succeed, and succeed, sorry. A good example would be Coca-Cola, for instance. You can't come and say, oh, I'm starting a clothing line and I'm calling it Coca-Cola. I'm going to register it in class 25. It deals with clothing, clothing and all of that. And my line is Coca-Cola. Even though, I mean, assuming Coca-Cola, because I know they already have a lot of trademarks registered in Nigeria, but assuming they don't even have any trademarks registered in Nigeria, they can oppose that registration because they're like, Coca-Cola is a very, even go to the innermost villages and say Coca-Cola or Coke, people know about it. I don't know if you get if that's I clear. Know. It's, it's very clear because also the recognizability of your and the popularity of your patent and trademark makes a whole world of difference. That's what you're saying. Well, so beyond, that's beyond actually borders. about, that's what I'm saying, but that's for trademarks. You know, I said mm -hmm. it depends. The general rule is that it's territorial. And then I'm, I was mm -hmm. just trying to give you an example of an exception, exactly. you know? So yes, the, I mean, to answer your question, if you've protected your rights, in Nigeria, does it give you international protection automatically? No, it does not. You know, it's territorial, your rights are protected in Nigeria. But there are certain instances where those rights that you haven't protected in other jurisdictions might be protected. Okay. Another example I would give you quickly is um, conventions. We have, I talked about conventions and national laws that we have for the various types of IP that we have. There are certain conventions that buy you time, so to speak, 
um, to go to other countries. An example I will give um, is, you know, I'm just being very mindful of time and I don't want to give too much information so that people don't get confused. You know, wait, but an wait, 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 wait give, just hold on. I want to give a very perfect example, which someone had asked earlier, which was about okay. when you go and develop your idea or your concept or your prototype in China, right? which potentially is your manufacturing factory or your manufacturing country. And then they steal that idea, even though you have trademarked it, maybe even patented it on this side. You take it there for manufacturing and they steal it and they then commercialize it as well, mass produce it. What happens to you? What coverage do you have? Yeah, so that was, I was going to get to that. Like I said, it's unfortunate and this um, there has been a lot of IP tests and lack of respect for IP all over the world, particularly in the so-called developed um, or industrialized nations, right? Um, I want to talk about conventions, international conventions for the protection of IP rights, right? If you register your rights under any of these international conventions, all the member countries are we are expected to recognize that right that you have. And there are so many of them. So for trademarks, we have the Madrid Convention for um, patents, PCT, and the rest of them. You know, so for instance, with the PCT, and I will come back to this particular question I've asked. For the PCT, for instance, Patent Corporation Treaty, it gives you a period of 30 months within which to go to all these other jurisdictions and register your rights if you're interested. So it, because the problem of territoriality, I'm a young guy, I just come up with a very brilliant idea. I know it's a great idea, it's new, nobody has done it, it involves a lot of creativity, invent, inventive step and all that. I know that it's going to blow, right? But I don't have all the funds I need to protect that idea and all that. But then I have certain countries I know that this is going to be a big deal in. So there are certain markets. I mean, I can't say I want to go to all the, I don't know how many countries we have in the world. I don't want to go to all the countries, but there are certain countries I know that this thing will move. Let's say I want to go to the continent of Asia. I'll pick China, I'll pick Taiwan, pick a couple of countries. I go to Europe, pick certain countries, go to uh, the, the US and all of that. You know, those are the countries I'm interested in, in selling. I know that I'll make a lot of money. This patent corporation treaty gives me the opportunity, right, to register my rights and within... So I was saying that... Um, the patent, the cooperation treaty gives you the opportunity to register your rights in the first jurisdiction, right, in one jurisdiction, and then you have a period of 30 months or to register it at the, um, internationally at the, with the World Intellectual Property Organization, was WIPO, which is the organization that administers PCT. And then you have the period of 30 months within which you gather the funds you need, identify how the business is going, check to see what you really want to do, the countries of interest and all of that. And then go to those countries one after the other, right, to register this right. Now, if at, within that 30 months, anybody else, you know, tries to do or register the same rights that you have registered. So, for instance, we're using the example you gave, you've gone to China, you've um, um, they've manufactured something for you, and then you come back to Nigeria and you realize that, oh, these guys in China, in China have gone to already you know, mass produces. If China is a member of the PCT arrangement, I mean, sue the, you know, protecting IP, it's a bit, it's, it's, it's very, it's not very cheap, to be honest, you know, but if you know that your idea or your creativity is worth so much and is valuable, and it should be, because for someone to sit down and come up with an idea or come up with um, something, you know, that is creative and that is useful and that would help others, then it should be valuable. Then you can, also go after them. So the point is, if your rights are infringed, right, it's not something that you just feel that, oh, they're in China, I can't do anything, or they're in Hong Kong, I can't do anything. Yes, initially, like I said, it's territorial and tough. You may have to deal with, you know, the infringement locally. However, where there are all these conventions, there are parties to these conventions and things like that, then you can also um, sue for infringement. But then, like, again, like I said, suing for infringement is not, um, it's not always the first step you should take, right? 
you can you can sign the C and D letter as a C and D letter, letting them know you are aware of their infringing activities and they intend to take steps. A lot of times, people that are infringing would not be swayed by the fact that you send them a warning letter or so because it's profitable to them and they know that they are going to make money from it anyway. So they're not even, they may just call your bluff. But then you can also get the um, um, hire a private investigator that will get um, relevant details. In that case, the C and D letter or the warning letter that you issued will sound like a, you know, part of a foundation to lay off for your case against them. And then um, as the next step, you look at link them, the um, options open to you in terms of litigation and all that. I don't know if this is clear. You are, you are very clear. Thank you, Chinasa. I wanted to check with you if you think this is a good okay. time to go to the chat room, considering that uh, it seems like our questions time is are, build, are, are building <laughs> and we want to give enough time to, to, okay. answer, to answer those questions. Is it okay? Uh, uh, go on, go yes, of course. It is. <laughs> okay, I wonder how far I need to go to get this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm a legal practitioner and a client has his intellectual property on a public sharing site without his consent. And I need guidance on how to go about it. And I said I was actually looking at the question as well. Hmm. So I've gone as far back as questions posted at 5.13. So the very first one was from Neka, Neka Ani, who's saying that her client has his IP on a public sharing site. I believe that that is maybe content, right? Mm -hmm. And that has is been posted on that public sharing site without his consent. How should she go about it? Okay, so my, my, the first thing I'll say is um, she, she needs to identify what the public sharing site, um, site is, sorry, right? Um, what's the name of the, who manages it? Who, you know, which one in particular? For most of these sites, they have um, terms of use, you know, and things like that. So you need to contact them and let them know that the article that is there is, um, it's, it's being shared without your consent, you know? Now I know that there are some sites where, you know, um, people have to first of all, um, fill, fill, out some, um, fill out some forms or some things to use those sites in the first place. However, all of them, okay, I'll give, an, I'll give a very um, good example. We had some client that I had, I had some, a client that had some issues with, um, with material being uploaded all over. Um, and then they're always popping up on Google, you know, when you search and all that. Beyond even the sites, we had to write, we, we engaged Google and we got them to pull, pull down all of those um, articles and material. I don't know if that's clear enough. But you, mm. the, the starting point is that you need to identify what the site is. You need to write to them to find out, um, let them know that this is, being, this is an infringement and this, the material was shared without your client's consent and all that. And if they don't pull it down or take it off or whatever, then you go the next step, like um, institute illegal action against them. Okay, so um, for everyone's clarity, I'm going to only be asking the questions that are posted, not the comments or requests for coaching. For now, we will not address the request for coaching. We will do that before the end of the seminar. Um, so we're going only to questions. I have a project summit I started last year. How do I put property rights over? As someone is already asking if she can host the same summit in Johannesburg. So this looks like... Um, there's already a conference which she has a title ownership of. Yes. And uh, how does she protect? I would say, first of all, um, get the name of the summit protected, right? That sound, might sound so simple and all that, but we have um, summits, conferences, things that you know, take place in different jurisdictions. Um, I'm sure you know about um, the Lagos Social Media Week, things like mm -hmm. that. And they run not just in Nigeria, but in other jurisdictions as well. So you need to be sure that you have rights to the name for starters, such that anybody that is going to 
replicate the same? I mean, I assume that you don't mind if there's going to be some consideration of financial gain to this. You don't mind it being replicated in other jurisdictions or in other countries. So get the name registered, ensure that you have your name so that anybody else that is doing it would have to license it from you, pay you royalties or some licensing fee, right? Try and, and then in doing that, because if you're going to get a license, if you're going to license it to them, you're going to have to have an agreement. So in that licensing agreement, you clearly state the terms of use, who and who, how is it going to be run? You can, and one of the most important terms of the licensing agreement is the quality, um, quality control, you know, your ability to determine what and what you want, what you don't want, and to ensure that they maintain it because it's your IP, it's an idea that you came up with and someone else is thinking of deposting it or doing it elsewhere. They should be, you should be able to control how it is done. So I would say get the name registered, right? If possible, get some sort of copyright registration for it. I mean, in Nigeria, like I said, we don't really, copyright is automatic, so it's not a registration, but just put something down in writing, Perhaps have it on your on your website or, or something like that, so that everyone it's clear to the whole world that you came up with that idea. Then license it to them. So this was about um, a product, right? So in a scenario where product A already exists, so for example, there's already a furniture design, and then you in, innovate on that product, so an improvement on an existing registration. Are you infringing on that registration? Um, if there's a, an existing registration and the, reg the rights are not yet in the public domain, you know, I mean, I don't know what sort of um, product it is, if it's a patent and registration or design or whatever registration that you have. If there's an improvement on it without your authorization, then that's an infringement because you cannot improve on something whilst there's still sub there are still rights that are subsisting on that thing without getting the authorization. Of that's the whole essence of a patent, right? Mm. But I have a patent mean that I have exclusive rights to it and I can determine who uses or who does not use it. So if you want to use it, then you should let me know. I will authorize you to use it and grant you the rights or you know license to do so. Okay, excellent. Now this is real intellectual property, right? That is what just videos that you have created for your training, mm -hmm. right? And that training happens, the, it's uploaded online. So training models uploaded online in video. How does this individual protect himself? Protect his content, sorry. Okay, so you have content that has been uploaded. Online, on video, okay. video training models. <laughs> that's actually um like you said it's 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 infringement definitely um you need to again like i said these things are not uploaded in the moon like there's a platform where they are uploaded right so you need to focus on whoever has uploaded it so if it's a company they have a website they've uploaded it on their website or if it's a you know whatever it is you know a business you need to be able to identify who it is or who, it, who the person that has uploaded it is you contact them, you know, and inform them that, look, you are infringing on my rights and I want you to stop. You need to get those videos off, off possibly even demand for payment, you know, for, for the period of time that they've had it on, up and running on their website or wherever they've, up, um, they've had it running online and then see what happens. Sometimes these things don't always have to be, um, don't always end badly. You know, in, yeah, I've seen situations where people start by infringing, but end up becoming partners because they now start paying huge sums, licensing, even, you know, paying the person to come on board and be part of them and all. I mean, the starting point that is it's IP theft, no doubt, our IP infringement for you to take someone's videos, upload it without authorization, without, you know, remuneration or anything like that, financial reward to the person that created them. However, the point is still that you first of all start by approaching them. I mean, I'm not the kind of lawyer that will tell you immediately something happens, go and, go and fight in court, go and you know, sue them for what they are worth and all that. No. Approach them and let them know that you are infringing on my rights. I take my rights seriously. I think you should pay me for infringement. And I also think you should stop infringing on my rights immediately. Right? Depending on the reaction, you know, you know the next step to take, whether to proceed further with legal representation or not. 
I'm going to now take some audio um, questions before we go back to the written ones. Uh, the very first person here is Samuel Obehe. Um, could you ask your question, please? Because you have your hand raised. Um, hi there. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I, 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 I was raising my hands actually to, <laughs> to be part of the coaching session uh, for next week. But I, I do have a question which I actually asked um, over on the, on the form that I filled out. Um, so my question is, um, you know, we're spoken about trade here, and one of the things that we're building here is a digital economy platform. And so that sort of thing now, everybody's involved in using this. And it, 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 we want it to be across the world where everybody's using this platform in every country to be able to reinvent GDP. And so how do you protect such a thing now that um, sounds like it could be like a a thing you should be writing in PhD, but because, uh, you know, it's, it's a new world now, digitalization can just come out and take over everywhere. So how do you protect such a thing now? And even the name, the logo, everything that we've made, um, we're, we're really worried that should we just let it out there and then the, the, the trademark and all those things will come after? Or is this something you protect first before it goes out into the world? And I'm, I'm, I want to refer Facebook as an example for this. That's my question. I don't know if, the, if it was understandable or I need to explain more. Or maybe if we went through that coaching session, I could tell more about what it is. <laughs> That's smart. Indeed. <laughs> I tried. I tried to. to because it's, it's really complicated. And I, I'm speaking to somebody in Bangor as well. Um, and hopefully she, she would be able to tell more about it too. But she, she, I think she's a very junior staff. And that's why what it's really that? hard to Um. Her name is, oh, please. Oh, you don't, can don't. tell me in the private. It's okay. It's okay. You can That's right. Me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, I didn't want to say her name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll be okay. happy to tell you more about this idea because I think, um, I, I, and I, I literally just go back to Nigeria. It's been, what, eight months. Um, but I, I'm re I brought it back home instead of doing it over there in the United Kingdom or in America. I decided to bring it back home. And so that's why I'm, I'm really particular about, do we just launch it out? Or is this something that has to be protected first before we launch it out there so that we don't um, um, lose, lose any of, the, of, the, of, of what we're trying to do for the African people? All right, Chinasa, over to you. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm just going to um, answer that. You know, in, unfortunately, this is just a very short time um, to be able to talk about all the issues that I would have liked to touch on. Um, so I didn't get to talk about this, for instance. There are different ways, I mean, you, in, in when you have IP, when you've identified that you have some IP or you've created something, you need to protect and secure it, right? Um, to be able to commercialize it. So for instance, if you were looking to have like venture capitalists and things like that, or investors and all that, they will take you more seriously when you have secured and protected your IP than when you haven't, you know? Um, in this case, right, um, it is not at every point in time in, in seeking how to protect yourself, it's always a balancing thing, you know? You need to know which IP, which, which of my IP do I need to register? Which do I need to keep as trade secrets? When do I launch my IP and things like that? And I guess that's the, 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 the case for you right now, right? Um, I would say for things like your trademarks um, and stuff like that, you may want to immediately file for registration of your, your trademark, get all of that sorted. For things that are your trade secrets, I don't think you should have them out there. You know, I talked about trade secret being that thing that gives you the edge in the market, that different thing. So you can talk about an idea and all of that without giving the punchline, like the main thing or what makes it different, what is already in the state of the art or what people already are aware of, you know, and all that without putting it out there. I would advise that you get your IP sorted, you know, not, there's nothing wrong in having a website, nothing wrong in you know, talking about in general terms, what you do or what you intend to do or achieve and all of that. But things like a sensitive information, you know, you may need to get all of that registered first. So the, the good thing about copyright is that when 
like I said, is automatic. So when it's out there, it's out there. You're the first person to put it out there and you have copyrights to it. It doesn't mean there won't be some unscrupulous people that would want to run behind your back and try to use your idea or even try to tweak it a bit to get some things done. And that's why it's very important that you get. So if it's something that is patentable, get a patent for it immediately. If you have um, a name that you're calling your product, get the trademark registered so that at least no one uses that trademark or logo or anything like that. You know, those are some of the steps you would take. But then you also need to be careful to be sure that if there are any serious or very important trade secrets, you don't put them all out there. Otherwise, people will steal your idea. There's nothing you can do. Remember what we said about trade secrets, that you have to have taken certain steps to protect it, you know, over and beyond the normal steps of, oh, I have something, I'm hiding it in my office. You have to take serious steps to protect your trade secret. Otherwise, anybody that uses it, that's tough. You can't do anything about it. Mm. Because Nigeria, for instance, doesn't have a trade secret law. There are some other countries or traditions that have that, but we don't have anything like that in Nigeria, right? So in the case of patents, you disclose to the government and then the government grants you an exclusive right to it. So it prevents everybody. So even though it's out in the open, you've got your patent, but it's out in the open, nobody else can infringe on your right. If they do, you can sue them for whatever they are worth, you know? But for trade secrets, once it's out in the open, that's it. That's why it's a secret. So you're supposed to hide it. So these are the things you need to consider. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, you have. And he's also pitching for the coaching. Um, so, <laughs> People are asking about the recording. Yes, the recording is always sent to everyone who participates in the, who registered for the webinar. So that's fine. Uh, and it's always available on ecoicenter.com. It's always available on our website. Uh, so I'm going to take the next person, uh, Olajide Phillips. All right. Thank you so much for this privilege. I want to thank our presentator for this uh, amazing work. You've actually touched some of my questions. But um, I think my question is related to what Samuel has. I currently have a, um, a digital product, an idea, a platform I launched six days ago. And currently on the platform, I have about 200 people on the platform. So when I saw the hard on Facebook, I quickly registered because I actually want to protect my idea. So what I'm asking the question is that, I don't know what do you think I can do to protect that kind of idea and um, so that I don't have people, you know, duplicate it and start using it anywhere or everywhere. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure I got your question. You have a platform, you have... Hold on a second, can you clarify? Is it an app or a software? What kind of digital product is it? Yeah, it's, um, it's currently on web right now, but we're currently working on app. Okay, so it's currently web-based, you're working on your app? You have yeah. 200 people already on, on the platform using it yes. and you Launch want to protect it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, like I said, um, it's usually better to start to get your IP sorted before, um, before you launch you know, um, to avoid unnecessary um, discussions and you know, unnecessary infringements and challenges subsequently, you know. Um, my question would be again, do you have a name, a logo that you're using and all of that? If you haven't registered it as a trademark, I would advise that you do so. Um, what the platform you're using, is there a special um, GUI, that um, global user interface that you use for it? You might want to just notify that, um, with the, send that as a notification to the Nigerian Copyright Commission. Um, NCC, we didn't talk about that. Nigerian Copyright Commission runs a notification scheme whereby you can submit, you know, works that you have created, you know, to them. And they have a, they have a database where they keep all of this. So whilst it is not technically speaking um, a registration, it's a it's like a database of all the works that people have come up and come up with and all that. And like I said. Um, copyright falls under the purview of um, software applications and all of that fall under the purview of copyright, under the definition in our, in our law. However, there have been people that have been able to get away with getting patent protection for their software um, when they're, once they're able to satisfy that the, 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 the product or invention or whatever, the software is new, involves some inventive activity, is, in, is capable of industrial application. Right, so you might be able to get patent registration, and again, we know a peculiarity in Nigeria where we say that um, 
the examination is as to form and not as to content. It doesn't mean that anything you go and submit will just be accepted like that. But well, the law says that they should accept once you satisfy all the um, formal requirements. So yes, you should also look at getting patent registration for that. You know, um, if you have um, terms of use, you should also have terms of use so that anybody that is going to use it would have to sign, you know, it's more or less like a license to use. You know, and that is a valid contract between you and whoever, even if there are one million users, as long as the signing, I'm sure that I know that for a lot of ads, before you can use it, you have to just, and I, most people don't read everything there, you just scroll, scroll, scroll and accept, you know, and sign using it. But all of those things are very important because you'll be shocked with the, the cases or the lawsuits that have come up from those things that you just signed without even thinking about it. So you need to have, excuse me, you need to have something like that, you know, the terms of use, have a license for people to sign before they use, you know. So um, I'm sure that if you do all of this, and then for people that you work with, since you said you're still in the developmental stages, you should look at having non um, confidentiality agreements with them. You should have non-disclosure agreements with those that are working with you or developing it with you to protect yourself that way. You know, you talked about the terms and conditions and agreements normally that we sign when we download apps or any of those other digital products. And someone is asking a very relevant uh, question here. It says, I am working on an app that involves collection of data from individuals. What kind of data protection laws exist in Nigeria that I need to be aware of? And also says, please explain GDPR. So I think the key thing is, you know, the, the most, the private our data protection laws, which ones are they that we need to be, to be aware of, especially those of us that collect data? We do collect a lot of data from contact information to emails to personal info. How is the consumer protected? And how also are we as business owners? How do we make sure we don't infringe on those rights? Okay, so let me just quickly answer. I was saying that, um, unfortunately, Nigeria is not, I mean, our laws are not as developed as some other jurisdictions. We're still at it, we're still working on it, and we will get there eventually. In the past, um, we could only rely on the constitution, you know, for, that protects individuals' rights to privacy and all of that. However, we now have the Nigerian um, Data Protection Regulation 2019, which generally regulates um, the collection and use of um, data, people's data. And, you know, one of the major things you need to know is that the NDPR strictly says that you have to have the user's consent before you can collect the data. So if there's no expert consent to the collection of data, then you'll be infringing on rights to be collecting the data. You know, that's one. You're not supposed to request for more information than you require. You're not supposed to, so if you need information to satisfy maybe your KYC, you know, you know your customer requirements or some other thing, but they're not able to access it, or information that they will use to navigate, they will need to navigate your app or your solution or whatever. That's the only information that you should ask for. So you don't start asking them who was your grandmother or um, where, where, which, you know, things that are irrelevant to the use of the solution or for the purpose for which you're requesting the information. And there's so many more, you know, there are so many other things that um, the NDPR provides for. So the main law that you may need to look at is the NDPR because it is more detailed, gives, you know, specifics. I think it's fashioned along the lines of the GDPR. So you can get more information that way. So that is, I mean, Besides the fact that our constitution generally provides that, you know, provides for an individual's right to privacy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Uba Sinachi, um, just unmuting you now. Okay. Hello. There we go. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Chinaza. Thank you very much for Hi. what you said so far. Um, quickly, my team and I, we're working on on an insure tech um, project. We're trying to build a, a model which we intend to pitch to firms within the insurance industry. So okay. I, would like to know, I would like to know what we can do to protect this idea of ours or this model of ours, such that even if we're rejected by firms we approach, they cannot use it behind us. And um, also you talked about copyright. I would like to also know what the give and take cost and the time frame to get one would um, B. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just a sec, before you answer, can I build on that as well? So that will also cover when we pitch our businesses to investors, when we pitch our businesses during hackathons or any of those 
kinds of public pitching bidding, how can we protect our, our IP in that part? So just, you know, stretching Ubasanachi's question a little bit more. Okay, I mean, it's a tough place to be when you're pitching. <laughs> I know that because I mean, I've worked with so many people that have come or I have this idea or I want to do this or I shared my idea and someone's told me or I went to someone. Else. And it's, 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 it's very surprising the big companies that are involved in quote and unquote stealing or in IP theft. You know, they call you, you go, you do your presentation and everything and they say, oh no, they're not interested. Well, that's not the with the where we're moving right now and then the next thing you see them deploy it and maybe tweak it a little bit but again it's a balancing act right on the one hand you need the investors or you need the people that would the capital you know you need the capital you need them to invest or you know in your business idea for it to come alive you know and that's a tough place to be but on the other hand, you've come up with something that is very valuable and that is very important to you. You know, it's your IP. It's something that it took your brain, you know, it's your brain work, so to speak. And you don't want to just give it all away. I would say have NDAs, um, non-disclosure agreements, you know, um, have confidentiality agreements and all that. But the first thing I would say is get a patent registration for that thing or get your IP sorted. I'm sorry I'm harping on it, but I'm saying this because I've, I've seen this so many times. In the first place, when you come to meet someone and you say, oh, I already have my, my this is my certificate of registration and all that, it automatically in, 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 um, increases the value of what you're discussing with them because they realize that this is the legal right that this person has. You know, it doesn't mean that if you don't register it, you don't have rights. You may have rights in what we call passing off, which is a common law right, you know, for using but not registr registering it. But it's always better to have a legal right because the law says that, you know, in most cases, what trademarks, patents, and all of that in Nigeria in particular, provision of your certificate of registration is, let me speak like a lawyer, it's prima facie proof of ownership. What that simply means is that it means, I mean, without any, it's like, it means you own it. So whoever is going to you infringe on your right or say otherwise has to prove that you don't own it. Do you understand? It removes mm -hmm. the question as to who owns this right or who was the first person to come up with this idea because you've already got your IP sorted, you know? So that certificate is there. And then the whole story of did you infringe or did you not infringe, even if the matter goes to court, you're not going to be proving anything. All you need to do is, this is my certificate of registration dated 2014, for instance. You know, and the person now has to show how that thing they're doing in 2020 is not infringing on that right. Do you understand? So the burden of proof shifts. That's one. Get your IP sorted. Number two is, you know, have, like I said, confidentiality, non-disclosure agreements and those kind of things. I would say, I mean, in my experience, it's not foolproof. The fact that you've got some guys to sign, oh, we're not going to disclose, we're not going to this, we're not going to that, is not always foolproof because, again, some people can take your idea, tweak it sufficiently enough for it to be a totally different product, you know? And under copyright law, ideas are not protected. What is protected is the expression of the idea. Just um, some days ago, somebody called me and said, oh, there was something about a payment platform that they had, and I don't want to go into details because it's a bit confidential, but somebody else had come and challenged it that, oh, they also had something like that. And I'm like, tough. You know, the idea of having a payment platform is an idea. Anybody can come up with that mm -hmm. idea. But the way you put it together, that's what gives you the air. That's what you, you're protected for. The special way that you've put your own package in it is different from the next person. And you get copyright protection for that. So some, some of these unscrupulous guys or companies or investors, sometimes, you know, they, they capitalize on that. They know, even just like with hackathons, I'm not always a very, I'm not such a fan of hackathons, I'm sorry. Maybe because of the IP that I do. Actually, I said, we need I'm money. Saying, we need money to run. To run I, but, but guess to, what? Guess to what? Incubate, I, I, to accelerate, I, I, we need money. Yeah, so it, like I said, it's a balancing effect. It's a balancing thing and you need to know when to run. And that's why your best bet is to get your IP first. You get if you have your trademark certificate, you have your patent certificate, your design certificate, whatever it is, already. If someone mm. is now infringing on that right, you can go on the basis of the registrations that you have to fight the person. But if you say, oh, we'll, fight, we'll, we'll sign a non-disclosure agreement or this one, that one, that one, you know, and all that, 
you know, they could protect you as a person and all that. But I also know that, which I will not discuss here, there are also ways of circumventing that. And so it protects you up to a certain level. You know, and again, mm-hmm. we have a situation that you could even go and tell the person, I'm not going to disclose until they sign. The person says, I'm not signing. It has happened. <laughs> it has true. happened to some of my and, clients. And you need the money. That's true. And you need the money. You need them to invest. So then you're stuck. The best bet for you, and I'll, I'll give a very light case. And again, I'm going to say it on a no name basis. I had a client that, very good client, and he always comes up with very wonderful ideas and all that. Unfortunately, he doesn't have all the money to push those ideas. Um, through you know and in the past he's gone to friends family church you know everything and they've helped him raise some money and some of those ideas flew you know but some of them did not so people are a bit weary to keep supporting all his ideas and then he came up with something that he had worked on for five good years he had been in R&D for five years and he was sure that this is the idea that's going to make him blow you know like I mean this is the product let me say product because idea is a bit technical that was going to make him blow using her Nigerian and, you know, and we all get- he, he went to pitch his idea and initially the first person he met, he met just said, oh no, I'm not interested, this and that and that and that. A few days later, I got a call, the guy called him that he should come and pitch the idea again. And then by the time he got there, the guy had his chief um, marketing officer, chief fin- uh, finance officer, chief technology officer, chief, they were all in the room and he was scared, like, what's going on here? Mm. You know, and they said, okay, this idea, please do everything again. And can you even send us this pr- prototype? And, you know, and all that we want to know. And that was when he called me and he said, man, I didn't, I forgot to, to carry along. You know, I have another client that had a similar thing, you know, and he went and the people said, pump and thing, they are not signing. It's not their policy. They don't sign. If you want us to, to do this, we will do it. We're not going to sign and so, so, and so, and so. And then he said, okay, and he went ahead with them. But then when the conversations went on, after one or two meetings, I attended with him, and then he now brought out his certificate of registration. They said, oh, we didn't know you had registered your patent. That was the last meeting they had with him. So it was clear that these yeah, guys were they, out they, to, had, they had a totally yeah. different intention. Yeah, they had a totally correct. different intention. And they realized, man, we can't play with this guy, I beg, just be going. You know, you know what you are uh, explaining, just you know, I can make a very simple uh, illustration of it. It's like uh, you already have an accident and you want to get, in, get an insurance, right? Mm-hmm. You get your insurance before there's any mishap, right? You don't get your insurance after the mishap. So it's like, it's like this. You have to register either your product or your service or your concept if you, want, if you really want it protected you have to invest in it. I, I yeah. know that time is really fast spent. I'm going to, um, there's one more question from uh, Emozino. I'm going to unmute him now, so her or her, now to ask the question and then we can uh, do a quick wrap up. Okay. Hello. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good evening. Okay, I'm uh, Marco Emozino from, uh, I work with Technology Incubation Center, Worry. And uh, we do a lot of uh, mentorship and assistance when it comes to intellectual property management and all of that. But the challenge or the question I want to put forward is, do we have a kind of an organization that provides the grants to assist most of these inventors? Because it has always been a scary thing each time we talk about advising these people, please go and register your patent so that on that others don't infringe on your rights. You see them trying to shy away from that responsibility. So I want to ask if there is such an, a window that provides a grant. And also, if, for instance, we, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, can hear you. Okay. okay, for instance, like for a trademark, when you see a symbol or an inscription that is registered as a trademark, there is a symbol that symbolizes that this symbol is registered. Then in terms of a patent, how can somebody know that this patent is registered? To a kind of scare whoever have the intention of infringing from taking such step. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to answer your question. Your, the first question is, um, what can we do to help people that, you know, 
have ideas and all that, and they're not too keen on registering their IP or don't have the wherewithal to do so. And then the second one is how do you know patents that maybe a product or an invention is covered by patent, right? So I'm going to answer that. But prior to answering that, I'm just I just quickly want to make a statement regarding the hackathon. I was saying something and I um, stopped at at a point. You know, um, it's a very common thing these days. You hear oh, we in so and so thousand era. We have even unfortunately been involved in drafting some of those kind of um, things for some for some people, you know. Um, the thing is, you have your idea and all that, you, you know, maybe you're a student, because I, I mean, I work a lot with um, students in some universities um, in Nigeria, you, the IP clubs, that is, you, they come up with all sorts of ideas, wonderful ideas, they have things they want to do, and you look at them, and I look at them, and young people, you know that these ideas are really, really good, you know that, you know, they could actually achieve something really great from that, and all that, they could get a patent, make some money, you know, be the next startup, and all of that. However, they don't have the funds or the money to do it. Someone now comes and says, oh, um, so and so, either a foundation, or a, um, can you hear me? Okay, a foundation or an NGO or an international body or something, something is coming. They're going to give you the first people $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, and everyone is shaking and running around, and people are submitting ideas, submitting ideas, submitting ideas. I'm sorry, a lot of those ideas, a lot of those hackathons are just to get fresh ideas, fresh, you know, fresh in, in, uh, innovations and things like that. Does that mean that everyone that does organizes a hackathon is, has an ulterior motive? No. Does it mean that they don't really want to help us in Africa and all of that? No. But the point means that the point is that in maybe in my experience anyway, in 90, maybe 80, let me not be too 80% of the time, these are people that want fresh ideas for their companies there. You know, so you're here, you come, maybe they give you ten thousand dollars, you're happy, you feel like you've gotten some money, one million naira, whatever it is that you get, you know, and you run away with it. These guys take it, go to their countries, multiply it, you know, develop something that is worth so much, and then they come and they're selling it to you and they're making billions, you know, and you don't know about it, you know. Um, for some people, they are lucky and that's how they get their break and all that. Again, I just keep saying it's a balancing effect. Make sure you have your IP sorted. Sometimes you even need to go further than Nigeria to get your IP registered, to get the kind of protections that you need. But that said, um, to come to your question about the hub, we work with a few hubs in Lagos as well, um, technology hubs and things like that. And this is always a concern, you know. What I do as a person and my firm also um, is that we also try to encourage startups, try to encourage the young ones, the people that are just up and coming. You know, our selling point has been is that we've been that we work with you from when you are small until you grow very big. And then no matter the kind of people that come to meet you, you're not going to leave us and go there because you know that we've been with you through it all, you know. And then again, it's sort of like a, a way to give back to um, people, to help people to also, do. and that's why I would say, for instance, I'm doing this thing about having um, five days of, you know, one hour each of, you know, coaching people to help you identify those, give you free legal advice. If you were coming, if you were going to walk through the door and come to my office to talk to me, it may not be free. It's, if I can tell you for free, it's most likely it not, not be free. <laughs> free advice, but it's something to just help people. To, so that's what I do. And I, I know a lot of friends in the IP field that are also willing and able to do that. You know, um, in terms of an organization, I can't, I can't, none really comes to mind at the moment. We have IP organizations and once in a while we have free legal services and well, not really free legal services per se, but free legal advisory and all that. Um, there have been cases, there have been times when we've been able to help people, you know, just pay the official fees and all of that and we can help you um, with what you're doing. I'm not saying it's something that happens all the time and all the time. We have a special, specialized unit for, you know, small, for some clients that may not be able to afford the very, um, well, not, I wouldn't even call it big fees, but for some, depending on your level, you may not be able to afford some of the legal fees that you need. Um, we have some discounted rates for them and all that. And I know that a few other firms have um, things like that. So I hope that answers your question. Um, on the second question about um, how do you identify a patent when you see one? 
um, the truth of the matter is this thing about trademark, you have that sign TM and then for copyright, you have the C in the little circle and all that. It's not Nigerian law. It's not a Nigerian practice. It's basically something that emanated from the US. And I think, I don't even know if they do that in the, in the UK, but it's, it's okay, it's mostly the US and I'll tell you why. Remember when I was talking about trademarks, for instance, I said that any, our law says that anybody who uses or intends to use a trademark can apply for registration. So the requirement to apply for registration is that you're already using that trademark in your business or you intend to use it, meaning that you haven't even started using it, but you plan to use it. You can apply for registration of that trademark, right? In a jurisdiction like in the US, their law says that you should have used your trademark before you would apply to register it. Okay, so it is that you're using this trademark, but you want to let people know that, look, this is a trademark, right? So you put the TM so that they don't either make it, something called dilution in, 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 in IP law, that is, it becomes so common, anybody can use it. An example would be, um, uh, which one would I use? Um, let me say Maggie, even though they are fighting it seriously. Maggie cubes that I used to cook. Sometimes you want to buy, um, seasoning for women in the house or cooks in the house and then whether it's no or hunger or whatever it is you just say oh give me maggie or write maggie in the list well that's not what it is it's a cube and the name of the trademark is maggie right again it's like jeep there was a jeep is a registered trademark but because people started calling every suv they saw jeep 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 so whether it is a crv or whatever it is pathfinder and all that people will still say oh jeep 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 and so that's what i mean by dilution so some people didn't want their trademarks to become diluted because the strength of your trademark is really what, you know, the strength of your brand to an extent, you know, or depending on how you, how you look at it. And so they decided to put the TM there to indicate that, look, this is a trademark. Again, they didn't want infringers to start using it. And they said, put it that TM. The same thing with copyright. So it doesn't mean that if you don't have that TM, that mark is not registered. Or if you don't have, if it doesn't have the um, C in the circle, that there's no copy, that work is not covered by copyright. It's still covered by copyright. So, but for patents, I'm not aware that there's any sign there. The worst, I mean, the most you can do is probably just say this is a patent of so so and so. Nothing stops you from writing it on the body of your, on your get up of your product, depending on what it is. So, you know, I put this up so that everyone can see uh, the email address in the event that uh, you want to reach out for, for legal support, IP group at bangwood.igodalo.com. And um, randomly, completely randomly, we have uh, selected five people. Actually, it was not completely random. Number one was not random. Number one was Mr. Determined, who kept asking <laughs> for it. So number one will be uh, Samuel Obehe. Uh, then uh, Ifeolua Mary. Mwachuku in Kiruka. Saratu Miller. And Kule Oshinoiki. So those will be the five uh, people who will receive the um, coaching, the the legal support concerning specific to IP and Chinasa has been very kind to, to offer that. So we will um, reach out to you. In fact, what I would request is if you could just send an email to info at ecoinnovationhub.com so that we can have your contact uh, email and then fix the appointment with Chinasa over the next five days. So it's Monday to Friday, you said. Each person has yes, one please. hour. Is that correct? Okay, yes, so we, we will definitely uh, schedule that. So Samuel Obehe, Ifeolua Mary, Mwachukun Kiruka, Saratu Mila, and Kunle Oshinoiki. Thank you uh, so much to you, Chinasa, and to our entire participants. It's been, I, I tell you, you know, a lot of um, information that you have shared. I think uh, what is critical is if your business, concept, idea, service is important to you, you protect it first before you go public. Because once you've gone public, then the discussion can, can go in any direction in the events that you're not protected. Chinasa, any last words? Um, I just want to thank everybody that tuned in and um, that joined us today. Um, it's been interesting discussing something I'm passionate about and something I enjoy doing. Um, I thank you for the questions. I thank you for the opportunity, Eco Innovation Center. I look forward to working more with you in the future. 
Um, I look forward to speaking with the people that um, will be having the coaching as well. And, I fi and finally, I want to apologize for the erratic nature of my internet. Um, I hope you were able to get some things anyway, and I hope it was useful. Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, so that's fine. That's the network. That's the framework within which we operate locally. And that's what it is. And we, we live with it in spite of. So thanks. Uh, thank you so much to, to everyone. I'd like to tell you ahead what our next webinar is. As you know, we run it every single Thursday. So the next one is about techpreneurship. We've taken this, we've moved this forward into the uh, 18th of June because we needed to have the real experts come to talk to us on this subject. And that's about your invention, your innovation. You want to launch that technology to market. How do you bring it to market? And that's so important. We can have the most brilliant of ideas. How do you commercialize and how do you make sure that you start to make money from it after you're protecting it, right, Chinasa? <laughs> you protect it first and then you go to market and come and make money out of it. And Kem Dilim Waje Beho is going to be the one uh, talking. She is uh, I mean, she's well known for, for, this, for this part of her business, digital transformation. That's what she does. She's been a, an Obama uh, leadership uh, nominee and really i mean she's an expert in this space so i would enjoy you encourage you please uh, join next week to understand this the best of ideas the best of concepts the best of innovation if it's kept in your drawer in your wardrobe delivers absolutely nothing to you you want to bring it to market you want to blow i've heard that so many times from china saturday <laughs> you want to <laughs> land it in the market and you want to blow so this is where you're going to learn how to do that so we're looking forward to catching up with you next week, Thursday. Once again, Chinasa, thanks. Once again, every single person that uh, has joined this, we also want to thank you. Have a lovely, lovely evening. Have a great night. And please stay safe. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you.